We can sit here and wax poetic about that all day long, but I, I'm really anxious to actually get your thoughts on the situation going on in mm -hmm. Afghanistan uh, because you were one of the first people that I reached out to uh, during that week whenever the United States pulled out and the Taliban basically marched right in. Um, and it, it's it's a major issue, right? Um, it's, it's an issue that unfortunately was on Americans' minds for about a week and a half, and then they moved on with their regularly scheduled programming and got outraged about something, you know, Trump said in a, in a media interview or outraged about this, that, or the other thing, or their Netflix account got locked out for 20 minutes and they couldn't watch their favorite show. No one's talking about Afghanistan mm -hmm. anymore, which is egregious. But I want to go right back to your initial thoughts. I did that series called Botching Afghanistan. I talked to a lot of people and got their initial thoughts on the pullout and kind of what you thought was happening. But I just want to kind of give you some space right now to describe what you think about our actions as a country pulling out of the country when we did, but also let's go ahead and get into some of the things that you've done, the things that you are able to talk about to help get some of those people out that were, were left in the crossfire literally once the United States pulled out and created mm -hmm. the vacuum. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, my personal experience in Afghanistan, I was there in summer of 2014. It was actually the same summer that ISIS was sweeping across, um, uh, Iraq and I was I was in Afghanistan right during the middle of uh, retrograde. Um, so instead of having a six month deployment, we had a four month deployment because literally in the middle of the deployment, that was when, um, you know, the uh, the powers that be decided to send everybody home. Um, I, I was gone uh, to sort of backfill some of the guys that had bu that had bumped into Iraq um, to call in the airstrikes on ISIS. Um, but when when my platoon left the base that they were at, they literally just hopped in helicopters in the middle of the night, set stuff on fire and just flew out without, without any warning and left the Afghans there. Um, this was back in 2014. And of course the Afghans were not even remotely uh, capable of, of truly being able to defend themselves um, without any kind of American support. So that entire area fell. So this is, this has been slowly happening. The, um, the, the, the dam has slowly been breaking over the last, you know, five, six, seven years. And, you know, th this precipitous pullout was the final, the dam finally broke and everything and all the water rushed through, right? The Taliban just took over the entire country, but it's been a long time in the making. Um, but yeah, but during, du when, when, when that whole thing, when that whole thing kicked off, um, yeah, I was immediately, of course, my, my phone immediately started blowing up and I, you know, I don't know anybody in Afghanistan. I, I was there, like I said, for three months in 2014. Um, and yes, we got to, you know, do a bunch of fighting and whatnot, but you know, I, I, I wasn't like an Intel guy at the time, so I didn't really know anybody. Um, I was just a shooter. Um, but you know, with, with stronghold rescue and relief, the, the NGO that I run, we of course started getting a lot of people asking us for help. So I just immediately started pulling all of my contacts and luckily we have the resources and we have the personnel now to, to really be able to kind of get into those places and make stuff happen. Um, so while, while all this stuff was falling apart, so I kind of, I kind of watched the airport. So I was actually aware of what was going on in Afghanistan and heavily involved in it before it ever hit the news. It was probably about a week, week and a half prior to it all actually being on the news. Um, I was already on the phone like 16 hours a day, uh, texting and calling and talking to 17 people at once and people trying to get uh, extracted and all kinds of stuff. Um, and, you know, so so while all that was going on, uh, and I, I saw that eventually um, we gave up the entire country except for Kabul airport, which is a very small, relatively small space. Um, I immediately, I immediately looked at that and I thought, you want to know what, like this place is a, either going to get overrun or B, we're going to be gone in about 10 days. And then there's nobody like a tons of, tons of people are going to get left behind. Right. So there's nobody to help. So what we immediately started doing, uh, me and my guys, uh, with stronghold, we immediately started looking for routes out of the country. We started looking for ways to sm start smuggling people, um, through into border countries without, um, you know, just basically just to get the heck out of there while, while, while we could. Um, and so what we did was we actually created sort of a, an Intel um, network of people, uh, people who are on our payroll, Afghans who are now on our payroll, and we set up safe houses and drivers and uh, passwords and all this stuff. I mean, it's very ad hoc, kind of thrown together. Um, but basically, we set up these rat lines so we can smuggle families out of the country who really, really need to get out of the country. And the, the type of stuff that we, that we do, we're not moving thousands of people. We're not moving, you know, um, uh, airplane loads of people. It's not buses full of people. It's one family at a time. And it's people who are no kidding going to get a bullet in the head if they're not out of there. 
Um, so we've actually, and we've actually kind of slowed down the amount of people that we're moving out because it's also very expensive. Um, we got a lot of people on the ground that need to get paid and, you know, making sure that, um, you know, we're able to, you know, fuel and vehicles. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. It's not just as simple, get on the phone and, um, you know, uh, get people out. Um, so yeah, so basically we have, we have several routes out of the country and right now we're still, um, on occasion we'll get, um, you know, one family here, one family there specific cases. Um, but the, the, the situation right now, um, is actually, it's actually kind of interesting. It seems to be, how do I, how do I word this? It's, I'm, I'm trying to word this properly. It doesn't seem like I, like the Taliban is going door to door, killing everybody. Um, it seems to be that they, I think that that will happen. I think that that's going to come, but I think right now they're actually being relatively restrained and I'm not sure why that is. I'm still, I'm, obviously I don't trust them for, you know, for two seconds, but it's, it's very interesting to kind of watch. I'm observing sort of what their, um, what their tactics are, what they're doing. Cause again, like I'm in direct contact with people who are on the ground, uh, in the country and on the border regions and everything. And they're reporting everything that they're seeing directly firsthand to me. And I'm kind of looking at the situation and it's kind of interesting. The, the, you know, the Taliban aren't necessarily, they're not ISIS, right? So we, when we think of terrorists, we think of ISIS and it's not ISIS. In fact, the Taliban and ISIS are like fighting. There's been a, bu- a bunch of killings and a bunch of bombs that have gone off. Most of the violence that's going on is actually between the Taliban and ISIS K at the moment. Um, but it's still extremely dangerous. They are, I think, I think, I think what the Taliban right now is doing, I think they are looking for very high profile, high level people. That's who they're looking to arrest. I don't think that right now they're really going after anybody who, you know, had like, you know, sold food on an American base or something like that. They're looking for Afghan army generals. Um, they're looking for government officials and things like that. So those are the types of people in those situations. Those are the ones who we are able to, um, escort and extract out of the country using um, a, a, a variety of, of, of means and like undercover rat lines. Um, so that's our work there. But, you know, it's 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 a it's a drop in the bucket of what needs to be done there. And I think that the the bigger the bigger issue and the bigger repercussion, I think that we're uh, seeing now, but we're going to see a lot more of in the future was the strategic value of of Afghanistan. Um, you know, if you look at if you look at history, um, so many armies, you know, 